my name is Nikki. I'm the curator at the Pemberton Museum. And this year, we're, our Teen Tales topic is transportation. Last year, Eric Anderson came from Squamish, and he presented a tale about the importance of the house sound corridor as a transportation route. And it was more in the context of the railway going in at the time. But we asked him to come back this year and expand upon that as a topic. Eric's a local historian. He grew up in Squamish. Uh, he went away to school and to work, and he's been back in Squamish for the last eight years. He's with the Sea to Sky Forestry Society, and we worked with him when we were celebrating the 100th anniversary of BBC Forest Service in 2012. And uh, he's also a director with the Chamber of Commerce in Squamish. So thank you for making the trip up from Squamish, and I'm glad that it was today and not yesterday during the festival traffic. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we really enjoyed your presentations last year, so thanks again for coming this Well, week. I certainly enjoyed my visit. I'm very delighted to be back here again. Okay. Now, it so happens that I've got a bit of an agenda today. I'm attending a public hearing tonight, and would you know it, it's all about Pemberton. <laughs> now, we've all heard of Port Pemberton, and the old Port Pemberton is about right here in the middle of this map of the forest district. But today, where is Port Pemberton? I would suggest it's Squamish. So my topic is going to be the connections between Pemberton and the coast, Pemberton and Squamish. And it's a very topical thing. I'm bringing this to the public hearing tonight because I have a lot of opinions about this. And you'll hear a few of them this evening here this afternoon. <laughs> so now I've set myself up as to the coast, also from the coast, both directions, and that's very important. I think that both directions, or each direction has a different function, different things going on, but they work together. And past, present, and future. We won't forget the future. Quam Blind Channel. Now, in fact, uh, they forgot to include it, because it's right here. This is all developed as, as a harbor front there, and it's for most of our timber. In fact, all of the timber coming from the Pemberton area comes down to here, but you can see they, they haven't included it, have they? Look at this one here. Here again, there's Port Pemberton underwater still. And that's a map from about 2006, and of course that's not true to reality, is it? And here's another one. We've already had a look at this one here, and it's underwater. What's going on? Well, what I'm trying to say here is that we better take it into, into account as we plan our transportation future and our land use that we look after people that are outside of Squamish and as far away as Fort Nelson, Northern Alberta, and Pemberton, Mount Curry. So here we are again, all underwater. Well, well. And this, believe it or not, is our official community plan, and we forgot to include Port Pemberton. It's depicted as blue underwater, but in fact that's all developed as harbor front. Now, here they're making plans and housing developers, we have to watch those people because although we do need them and they put together some great projects, we have to make sure that they also are a part of long-term thinking and long-term planning. And when they made the plans for the Squamish Waterfront, unfortunately, uh, we missed it again. There's Port Pemberton and there's Squamish Terminals. All of the uh, terminal facilities here didn't really get figured into their plans. So we're going to be there tonight and make sure that they think about it. So this is what they have planned. It's high-rise residential towers, 12 stories here, here, and here, right across from Port Pemberton. And uh, they better know that Port Pemberton is not going to close down. It still needs to be there to handle timber, make a little bit of noise, a little bit of dust now and then. Now, my message is that I think that we can learn a lot from history and apply it to our planning this is Port Pemberton, a part of it. Part of it goes around there. Now, all of the uh, uh, Little Watt Nation's timber uh, uh, holdings, this all comes through this facility here. And right across there is planned a six-story hotel. Well, it'll be an interesting view, but I hope they like it. <laughs> Another thing that's going on in Squamish is that uh, people don't realize that we're a railway town, just like Pemberton. In fact, the downtown area of Squamish is surrounded by railway on three sides because you have the railway spur going out to Squamish terminals, another one going south, and another one crossing the of the, uh, the upper part of downtown. But yet, every two weeks, somebody writes a letter saying, that CN rail, that's just no good. 
we've got to either close them down or build an overpass or something. We just can't put up with this any longer. <laughs> of course, they've been there for 110 years or so, or nearly. But so, what happens is these letters get put on the top of the council agenda. We better make sure those council people know about Port Pemberton and Port Nelson and Northern Alberta. So, coastal connections need protection and they need improvements too. I'm thinking about roads and railway. We could use another tourist train, couldn't we? So, history can help us raise awareness for this ongoing campaign. And we're going to have to be working towards these things for a long time ahead. And history can draw attention to things that don't change much. And what's at stake? What are the values in these transportation uh, improvements? So, the history, Port Pemberton's coastal connections are a part of. Well, this is really interesting. I think it should be part of every school curriculum is our Pemberton Trail. The Pemberton Trail is part of world history and has been for a long time and in different ways. World history before the Europeans came here, it's a part of First Nations history. It's a trade and travel route for thousands of years. The same one. The Northwest Passage. What was Captain Vancouver here looking for? The Northwest Passage. We can tell that story from the Pemberton Trail, the southern end of it. The Gold Rush, of course. And Confederation, we'll come to that. The Canadian Pacific Railway is also a part of our Pemberton Trail history. And the Klondike and the Northwest Passage by rail, that was my topic last year. The Panama Canal was also a part of our Pemberton Trail history. And the Titanic, would you believe? Well, so, we talked about the First Nations Trade and Travel Corridor. Now this is partway down Howe Sound at Fury Creek. And we can see there's a wolf outline here, and a human figure here. The human figure is in a coastal design. The wolf is in a design that you might find around here, in the rock art that you would find around this area, or further north up in Lillooet. Very distinctive. And side by side, that's because it's an ancient trade and travel corridor. Here they are here, the wolf, and perhaps this is the serpent slayer, and this is the double-headed serpent. And that's at Furry Creek. It's at a grand location. Uh, Grease Trail. Um, there's no Ulican up at Lillooet, and there's no Sockeye down in Squamish, so there was an ancient trade along the Pemberton Trail. That Ulican trade started here around the Adventure Center. All these sloughs around here is where the Ulican were spawning. Captain Vancouver, the Northwest Passage, he wasn't very impressed though because he didn't find it. And he noted in his journal this is a dreary, comfortless region. And unfortunately, it got attached to the maps for a long time, and so we didn't see any tourists for decades. <laughs> so, the Northwest Passage, part of the history of the Pemberton Trail. All he saw was snowy mountains, nothing there, but the Gold Rush people investigated further. There is uh, uh, Joseph William Mackay, an ex-Hudson's Bay fellow, and the British Navy. Joseph Mackay was hired by Lieutenant or the uh, Governor Douglas to explore from Port Pemberton south. And the British Navy, they went in the other direction a couple of years later, and they finally mapped all of this. This ancient corridor finally got mapped in 1858-1860. And uh, Confederation, I mentioned, 1871. One of the things Canada and British Columbia agreed on in 1871 was the strategic importance of the southern end of the Pemberton Trail. They made this a port reserve. That line there is now Pemberton Avenue, right across this mouth of the Squamish River there, and all of that south was declared a port reserve in 1871. And in 1876, the Squamish chiefs agreed to this. They said, yes, we agree, it has strategic importance, you can give us these lands instead. So they got all kinds of reserved lands up, up there, elsewhere in the valley. But that was a port reserve that far back. So that's the Confederation connection. And then we have the Canadian Pacific Railway. And they explored here. Mr. Smith and Mr. Uh, uh, Joseph Hunter. And then the Klondike. 
when the Klondike happened, we got to get people up there. Well, what did they think of? Let's build a railway up the Pemberton Trail. Let's go over the mountains from North Vancouver, up the Lynn Creek or Seymour Creek drainage there, come down the Stuamis. There were various options they looked at. As far back as 1890, a railroad to Alaska up the Pemberton Trail. And my topic last year when I was uh, your guest, uh, Walter Mobley and his efforts to build a railway up the Pemberton Trail. He, he was a um, he couldn't he was obsessed with that idea. In fact, he wanted to build an electric railway. Now, you see there's all of these railways were going to be built up to Dawson up in the Yukon, all up the Pemberton Trail. And here's Walter Moberly's plan, 18, nine, sorry, 1908. Map showing electric railway from Seymour Narrows to Lillooet Lake. Basically, going up our trail. Now, later when the Panama Canal was being built, everybody thought, wow, we got to get in on this. We have so many resources, we can ship back to the old country through the Panama Canal. So we better build a railway up into all of that timber, and all of that gold, and all of that farm country. So that's what this project was all about. And uh, Mr. Gill, who's by the North Vancouver Outdoor School, just north of Squamish there, was his ranch. And he thought, yes, this is what we need to do, is build a railway up to Pemberton. And uh, all of the timber, we can make it, make it go selling timber off these, uh, these areas. So that was all connected to the Panama Canal. Without the Panama Canal, there would be no railway here. Those investors, where were they? England. They thought so too. Panama Canal will open up these possibilities to bring products from this wealth of uh, the natural resources of British Columbia. So all of these people, the speculators, they're the well-to-do people of Vancouver. They're speculating on the Panama Canal. So we're part of that history. Newport is on the map because the Panama Canal is coming. And when did that open? About 1914, 1915, somewhere around there. During the war, unfortunately, so there was a little bit of a slow time. Uh, but all those resources, they thought, we're going we're gonna to ship them back to England now, through the Panama Canal. And Newport is going to be the new pearl of the Pacific. And uh, now we come to the story of the Titanic, linking up the Pemberton Trail to the Titanic, believe it or not. Because when that railway was eventually built from just north of Squamish at Chikai up to Pemberton, it was Mr. Hayes behind it. Mr. Hayes was the mastermind behind the Pacific Great Eastern Railway because he was building the Grand Trunk Pacific out to Prince Rupert, but he needed a route down to the south because he realized he had to cover everything. And so he, he was the mastermind behind the scheme to build the Pacific Great Eastern Railway. Unfortunately, he went down on the Titanic. Now, a lot of people argue over if he had not gone down on the Titanic, would the PG have been a bit more of a success? My theory is no, because everybody was scheming and they had, their ideas were just too big for the time. And it would be a long time before there would be the population and the markets to support these grand investments in railways. But, nonetheless, the Pemberton Trail story is connected to the Titanic, because when he, when he went away, there wasn't that you know, mastermind to sort things out when things did take a downturn in a, in a worldwide recession just before the war. So that's Mr. Hayes, and there's the fellow that the railway got turned over to, his right-hand man, Darcy Tate, after whom Darcy is named, of course. And everybody very sorry to lose Mr. Hayes because he really was a doer. No, I, I think that we have a lot of work to do, and it's important work, to chart this history, this rich history of the Pemberton Trail, we'll call it, or the Squamish Trail, if you like. And um, one fellow was doing this several years back, 1998, and uh, Mr. Eric Johnson, and he's looking at part of that trail and looking at where exactly were they going to put the railway. Where did the road end up? And getting this all sorted out, and it's beautiful hiking country, isn't it? Through the canyon and up along here, we now have a Sea to Sky Trail along this route. So I think there's all sorts of possibilities to develop interpretation along this route, tell the story about that CPR, tell the story about the Titanic for all that matters. But anyway, Mr. Johnson is looking over part of that Pemberton Trail above the Chequemus, 
And here he's looking at how they, did, they thought that they were going to maybe put the CPR through here too. They chose another route because Burrard Inlet is just such a superb harbor, way better than Squamish. But they thought about it. And so this, I think this is done now, well, 15, 17 years ago, I guess. And I think we can do much better today. We have better information, better mapping, better tools. And I think that we'd have a lot of fun making, tra making trail signage and new stories to tell along that trail. Now, we also have a lot more information because of the internet. We can look things up, we get them digitalized, and we can find out things we never dreamed of. In fact, all of our histories, not quite being rewritten, but we're sure, certainly adding to them. Adding things we didn't know about, like what was going on in Ottawa or Victoria. You know, the big boys, what were their schemes behind it all. And we can also learn about the local picture too, what families were up to through newspapers and that sort of thing. So this Pemberton Trail I mentioned in Confederation, there's 1871, there were people that went through here and wrote about it, but we're just finding out about it or rediscovering their stories. And we haven't properly shared them yet. So there's lots of cool things we can do in putting together new stories to share in schools and otherwise. Now back, I'm not sure when, it'd be 1930s, the famous story about the Pemberton Trail is the Carson and Huey uh, cattle drive. And I think that was in about 1875 or so, when the trail was sort of semi-finished and they came down from Pavilion. Well, the son of Carson, Robert Carson, was E.C. Carson, Ernie Carson, who became a cabinet minister in Victoria, Minister of Public Works. And he had this cairn set up in North Vancouver. It's at the mouth of, uh, is that Seymour Creek or Lynn Creek? One of the two. Yeah, Seymour. Seymour, thank you. And so we're right beside the mountain highway. And I think that we need to now remember Mr. Carson fondly for setting this up. Whoops, I've got to put it this way. And reminding us and preserving the memory of that cattle drive. But there were many other stories that we have. We shouldn't forget and we should um, bring, bring them forward and uh, enrich them. That's the, the whole, uh, what we can describe about this trail route. Now here, Lillooet Trail, terminus site of a trail from Lillooet Country to Burrard Inlet, under construction from 1873 to 1877, used in a cattle drive in 1875, I think, or 1877, by Robert Carson and Richard Bowie. And, uh, but that was just one story. It's the one that's best remembered. Let's keep it there, but let's add more to it. And now we can, because we have access to much more. Now this is Rose Tatlow, was the editor of the Squamish Times, and she was very interested in the trail, and she thought that some of it should be preserved. She said in 1964, by the way, in some spots north of Culleton Creek and in the Chequemus River side of the highway, if you look closely along the rock slides, you can see portions of the old Pemberton Trail. Someone should tell Mr. Kiernan, the Minister of Highways I at the time, I think, about this and ask him to preserve them as a historical site. Do you know that we still haven't done that yet? That's 50 years ago, that idea. We, ha we still have a lot of work to do. I think it's very important. So here's uh, the Sea to Sky Trail. Uh, Gordon McKeever at Whistler has done so much work behind that and he gave me this photo down at the bottom here and it shows you, I believe that is uh, uh, Myrtle Phillips on horseback there and uh, this is the exact site today in the canyon so we can do so much more. Now this story about the Carson and Huey cattle drive, it's a shame that we don't that we forget that there was so much traffic, lots of people using this trail right from the beginning. Where did the people at Squamish get their, cow, their, their oxen from? Here. Where did they get their horses from? Here. They drove them down the trail. They were doing that way back in the 1880s when settlers happened. Coming into the Squamish Valley, all of their livestock came down the trail from this valley. And that's Mr. Schoonover. He's going to go logging. Up. Yeah, so that's Mr. Schoonover. Now, another fellow that's very uh, well known uh, in the trail as a packer was Ray Elliott. For years, he was had teams of horses. And he paid a visit to Squamish in 1950. Mr. Elliott. 
along with Clifford Thorne and several others, lived to take the used to take the pack trains over the old Pemberton Trail between Squamish and Pemberton. He had tales to tell of many trips and uh, uh, cattle drives, snowshoe trips. We brought cattle from the natives at Pemberton, he recalled, drove them to Squamish, and during the construction of the railway, it would take eight or ten days to make the trip, and we, and we old newspaper here, we brought out 300 cattle, a head of cattle all together in a typical drive. And then he goes on about the stories. And all the swearing that took place because some of those cattle were pretty stubborn. Now this is Mr. Elliot, and that would be somewhere in the uh, Chuckamas area. Ray Elliot and his brother ran a hotel in Squamish at the other end of the Pemberton Trail. Another fellow is the Thorne family, early pioneers in the Squamish Valley. They had the Hop Farm in Brackendale. And uh, so Cliff Thorne paid a visit, and he had an interesting story to tell. This is back in 1989, uh, that paid a visit to the newspaper office. It says, the valley has only a narrow, oh, I'm going to go ahead here. This one, this is what he's talking about. This is the, the Paradise Valley. So when you're going up along the Chekmas on the other side of the river there, only a narrow entrance as the road passes through two stony cliffs. You can just see those stony cliffs here. And this was why, according to Cliff Thorne, it was once a haven for cattle rustlers. He assured me that in the days when cattle were brought down from Pepperton along the trail which ran along the present railway on the east side of the canyon, the odd steer would be driven out of the herd and through the narrow entrance, which was closed off with a gate. Later, the rustlers would return and remove the cattle at their leisure. So a little haven for cattle rustlers until the loggers came and blasted that through a bit more, so it was no longer such a secret item. There's Mr. Thorne, and they're crossing the Chikai River, heading up the trail. He and his brothers. Now here's another part of the, the, the history, and we come back to our First Nations aspect of it here. Who were doing, who were the labor force it, for the hop farms in Squamish, there were 10 hop farms in Squamish, one quite a large one, significant hop growing there for nearly 25 years. They had Japanese, Chinese, Sikh people, but mostly people from Mount Curry. All these folks here, they brought their horses with them and they're going to have a horse race there on Government Road in Brackendale, probably at the end of the hop picking season. And this is the thing that the whole community came out to watch. It was quite a little bit exotic and interesting. And there they are. These families would come down from here, picking hops, an annual thing. They did it for over 20 years. Many families from this valley would go down and pick hops. You can see here they had their regular lodgings on the hop, main hop farms of Brackendale. And I'll bet that those people, these families, they could be identified still today. These photos come up to about the First World War. So many families from this area would go down to pick hops. And the Squamish people, what were they doing? Well, they were down in the Fraser Valley picking hops. Maybe the wages were a little bit higher down there. Or they'd be down in the canneries too, as well. Now, this is uh, another aspect of the First Nations history of this corridor, is the Catholic Church. It's very interesting that the Catholic Church, the Catholic faith, did not come by water along the coast. It came from the interior, of course. And there was a very strong element of French-speaking um, people in, in the church and the French influence of the French language. Now, a lot of the churches in this corridor from here north, they were built in the 1890s. And Emily Carr came here and was very impressed with them and made many sketches of these old churches, some that are gone now due to fire and so on. And the Kamloops Wawa, the first time somebody tried to write down the Squamish language was within the Catholic Church. They put it into Chinook. Different prayers of the, in Squamish translated into Chinook and they would publish them. What's this? In 1890, 1896. So this is another aspect of the corridor and our trail and its history is, if you like, beliefs going up and down and culture moving up and down the corridor. Now, we come to the mouth of the Chequemus River, coming down this way. 
There's the Chikai River coming into the Chequemus. And the highway going up here, the old one, the new one goes up here. And this is an Indian reserve called Uquits, Indian Reserve number 12. Nobody lives there today, but it's a place for feasts and special ceremonies. Always was, it's always described that way by the Squamish people. Why is it there? Well, that's the old mouth of the Chequemus River. So when the interior Salish people come for a visit, they come down the river and they come to Euclid's. It's a special gathering place. Remembered that way in my lifetime. Elders Dominic, Charlie would come to our elementary school and talk about Euclid's and the gatherings he would have there. And some anthropologists had looked at Dominic Charlie's stories and his dance, his description. He was a, a prophet. You have some with certain skills. Dominic Charlie was a prophet. He could see into the future. And some of his stories have a lot of Christian elements to them. That's not a, a, by accident. It's because that Catholic church influence was coming down the valley and they all met at Euclid's on the other side of the Squamish River at the old mouth of the Czechos. So that's another set of stories about our Pemberton Trail. Here's an interesting thing. Mr. Galbraith built this hotel in 1902-1903. It opened up right at the mouth of the Squamish River, or the old mouth of the Squamish River, and uh, he came from Harrison. Why did he come move his operation to Squamish? Well, it's very interesting. In 1903, it says here, this year has been one of great progress on the Squamish. In both public and private enterprise, great strides forward are to be seen. In the years gone by, the landing was at the mercy of the tides. The old wharf at Master's Landing, that's up by the downtown waterfront, that was just no good. Now they have a 2,700 foot wharf stretching out over the muddy shallows so they can bring bigger boats up. And just here too is the new store and hotel lately erected by David Galbraith. For many years an enterprising, enterprising merchant at the CPR crossing of Harrison River. Why is he coming here? It's because the, the, the people from Mount Curry have changed their patterns of movement. Instead of going down to Big Smoke down Harrison Way, they were coming down to Squamish to pick hops. And Mr. Galbraith, a trader, moved with them. And I think that this is an underestimated aspect of how our corridor got developed relative to the Harrison Lake, is the movement of these people and the hop picking during those years, 1890s right up to World War I. And all of these merchants had to follow them. Of course, they were a big part of the population here at that time. And then here, downtown Squamish, this is what it looks like today. But up until the, say, Second World War, that was a horse corral. Where did the horses come from? Pembroke Valley. Here you can see in an old insurance map, this is Winnipeg Street in downtown Squamish, 1928 insurance map. Sure enough, it's a horse corral where Mr. Monroe would break in horses. And here's another part of the Pemberton history of what is now what I'm calling Port Pemberton, Squamish Harbor. Welcome. Is uh, cattle, livestock, agricultural production a big part of our relationship in the past? The Squamish and Outlet, the railway, the possibility to bring products out to market. This is a very interesting map I just came across recently. And uh, some folks up at Pavilion telling the story about all of these. Uh, this is the Duffy Lake route, and this is the Seton Lake, Anderson Lake route there. And there's just so much to do to develop these stories and landmarks for tourism and for a circle route. Build that circle route program offering for visitors. We have many visitors that would be so interested to learn more along this route and to have better roads too. And so we all can work together to develop the, the stories part, I think is important to the investment. And I'll have an example of that. George Henry, when I met him last year, he told me something I hadn't really thought of. How sound is probably one of the only fjords in the world that you can drive up. And it's true. But how was that road built and why? It was built for tourism. And Garibaldi Park. This is from 1930s, long ago, idea to build a road, but these people worked really hard at it, and they developed the Diamond Head Chalet in Garibaldi Park from 1944, the Brandbold brothers, and Otto Brandbold's wife, Joan, 
She grew up in West Vancouver. She was a talented artist, first woman member of the Board of Trade in Squamish, and she really did launch Squamish tourism brochures, pamphlets, filmmaking, this sort of thing. They had a lot of energy and single-handedly convinced the politicians, boy, maybe we should build a road to Garibaldi Park. And eventually they did. That road was largely, the rationale for it was to develop tourism. And we need to do this again. We need to, do, to improve our routes through this country, and tourism will be part of it. But we need to have a coherent rationale, because the politicians just won't accept any kind of uh, idea. Uh, so, they had a lot to do with the building that Sea View Highway, now Sea to Sky Highway. And you can see here, road opens gate to north. You don't see any story about the building of that highway in 1958 that doesn't have a picture of Garibaldi Park. There isn't, you won't find it, because it was a big part of that highway construction. Will the door be opened at last to magnificent Garibaldi? The vision going back many years finally realized almost in 1958, but we still had a pretty crappy road up to uh, in that part of the park, still today. So, new highway opens way to hinterland development, tourism development. Because for products, shipping out goods, the railway was just fine, and barging was just fine. The main priority of the road, bring tourists in. So that's the story of that road. Uh, so, they had a lot to do with the building that Sea View Highway, now Sea to Sky Highway. And you can see here, road opens gate to north. You don't see any story about the building of that highway in 1958 that doesn't have a picture of Garibaldi Park. There isn't, you won't find it, because it was a big part of that highway construction. Will the door be opened at last to magnificent Garibaldi? The vision going back many years finally realized almost in 1958, but we still had a pretty crappy road up to uh, in that part of the park, still today. So, new highway opens way to hinterland development, tourism development. Because for products, shipping out goods, the railway was just fine, and barging was just fine. The main priority of the road, bring tourists in. So that's the story of that road. Now, um, here we are again at Chequemus, and the railway here, the Pemberton Trail is right here. You can still see part of it. Looking across on North Vancouver Outdoor School on the dike there, looking across the Pembroke Trails just over there. Not many people take a walk there, but it's really quite a nice trip. And uh, there's part of it. Of course, in drier weather and less slippery conditions, but that's our <laughs> Pemberton Trail. And uh, it's really neat. I think that we could do more to develop this, make it safe, and preserve these parts of it. Now, to do this, we have to also remember how we're going to pay for it. Tourism generally doesn't build roads. The government took money from somewhere else and put it into that road. They took it from resource revenues. We still need those resource export revenues to build these roads. And this, this uh, corridor is still a major export corridor for forest products. This is the old logger. I think they called it the Squamish logger left from Pemberton a couple of times a week. We also choose to ship out gold here from the Bridge River country. And, and that was uh, uh, still a very important part of our dual gateway at Squamish. Inbound tourists, outbound exports, they have to work together. Got to get the money from somewhere. Squamish is a hub for shipping pulp from all over Western Canada. We need to keep this in mind. And I'm going to be coming back shortly to where I began with planning of Port Pemberton. So here we are, pellets. Now, where are we going to ship out pellets? It's going to get congested in North Vancouver, where we are here. And there is talk about a pellet plant in Lillooet, because there's certainly forest conditions that could contribute to a pellet plant, making products with all that dry pine, improve opportunities for forest management. But we need to have the transportation to do that. And here's a pellet train coming through Squamish. So Squamish, Port Pemberton is still the closest for a large area of Western Canada. It's closer between Squamish to, from Prince George is shorter distance than Squamish to Prince Rupert. We don't often consider that. So what we don't want to do is have short-sighted planning. And a few years ago, CN Rail 
You have to watch these big companies because they have a mind of their own and they're slow to turn around and they're kind of based far away. But they had the idea that, well, we'll just close down this, these tracks going through here. We'll turn it into a road for tourists or something like that. We'll just build it over to Ashcroft there. And uh, the problem with that is, is that we have a countryside with all sorts of issues with landslides and vulnerability, avalanches uh, in, in the wintertime. So we really don't have any rail corridors that are expendable. We need them all for backup. And here down here, where else are you going to ship out all of the forest products, all of the timber? Not through Harrison Lake. It's not really that practical. Not a good road there. You could improve that road, but there's fisheries values there. And a uh, better opportunity to develop proper facilities at Squamish. So we still need that too. And we have wood coming from way far up north by train still today, and from up the coast. So short-term thinking, well, CN, we heard rumors that they were considering maybe we should, because this is very expensive to fix this. This happened in March or February this year, I believe. Big bill to fix this job. Delayed everybody for quite a while. We heard there were some conversations about, well, what's the long-term picture here? Should we continue to be investing here in, 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 in maintaining these tracks with the more limited use for CN than back in the old days? So we need to be careful of this and ensure that we think for the long term. So here we are again at Port Pemberton of today. This happens to be the Squamish Mills. Next door is another operation there. And in the future we might ship out pellets or any number of things, including manufactured goods. Now in the old days, the tourists were over this side and the freight was over here and they got well acquainted with each other, knew each other a little bit better than today. And we may not be able to practically do that in future, but we still nonetheless have to have good conversations. And uh, here's some conversations happening with some politicians from Squamish up looking at your road difficulties up in this area, a little bit further north. But I think it's very important that we work together through our Chambers of Commerce, Pemberton Museum, Sea to Sky Forestry Center, Railway Park, and uh, all be working with the same goal of uh, trying to build this vision of improvements, protection, enhanced tourism, and uh, enjoyment for all of our visitors. Now I'd like to finish off with just some thoughts from Austria. And uh, I find it very interesting that countries that have not the same spectacular mountain landscape that we do, not in this district anyway, but they do more with less. And uh, this, they have a program here for a district that's stretches say from Squamish to Skookumchuk, let's put it that way, a network of valleys in Austria, and this is about just taking the theme of wood, see what you can do, develop a tourist program. Wood, identity, development, the future, environmentally green products, and it all began with a museum in this little district of Moral in Steiermark or Styria in Austria. How can we showcase wood? Well, wood has history. And this is just an example. We might pick something else, agricultural products, for example, but drive it, push it, tell the stories behind it. Modern materials, design, we can do that too. We have fine buildings here in Pemberton, new ones, in Squamish too. Museum as venue for artists, wood sculpture, changing exhibitions. We can do this in a number of facilities around our district here. A uh, house demonstrating uh, up-to-date housing uh, construction methods. You have a plant here in Pepperton. We have one in Squamish. We can put those on the map, bring tourists through, because these plants are exporting anywhere with prefabricated modern wood building systems. And this is what their idea is too. Impulse giver for development of wood plus heritage throughout the region of Mora. And it all started with the museum like the Pemberton Museum. I was just discussing earlier with, uh, with Nikki, the Skookumchuk Church, which is really a treasure. Now we could have a bookend of our region, is really the Skookumchuk at the top of Harrison Lake, down to Squamish, and we could put together a little tour, tour map for tourists. It will, it will build it over time. Anyway, that's just one idea. <laughs> well, I have a few other things here. But I think I'll leave it for that. I'd be very delighted to chat with you further. If anybody has any questions, 
So this is my idea that we make this an ongoing project to develop telling the story of our trail, our Squamish Pemberton Trail, and its place in world history and in the future of the world too. Thank you very much.